The Athletic. Hi folks, welcome to another episode of The Athletic FPL Podcast. I'm Mark McGettigan. You can find me on Twitter at FPL General. Game week 9 is in the books and what a crazy game week it was. It was a reminder of just how punishing this game can be for many. Making sound logical decisions doesn't always result in a positive outcome. If we knew before the game week deadline that Chelsea would score 7 against Norwich, we would have all been on Kai Havertz captain. Manchester United have been poor this season, but I don't think any of us expected Salah to score 48 points as captain. If you were on the wrong side of variance at the weekend, don't panic. Don't make any rage transfers. Trust the process and come back stronger in game week 10. There's a long, long way to go in the season. If you captain Havertz, don't beat yourself up about it. It was a perfectly viable choice. On another day, the German is involved in three or four of those seven goals and Salah has a quieter day against Manchester United and the narrative is completely different. Don't let one weekend change the way you play this game. It's a Saturday deadline for game week 10, 11 a.m. UK time. There's EFL Cup ties on Tuesday and Wednesday this week with 12 Premier League teams in action. So be patient with your transfers if you can be. Popular picks Rafinha, Vardy and Mbumo are all yellow flagged. So it's a week where we need to wait for more information before making our changes. On today's episode, I'll cover the game week 9 headlines and shoutouts. We have a new member to the 59th Minute Club. Do a quick game week review, update the watch list, answer Twitter questions and discuss game week 10 captaincy and transfers. Although I think the captaincy discussion is going to be about three seconds long. There will be another Athletic FPL podcast on Friday when we'll have a lot more information. So make sure to hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening for that one. And if you'd like to become a subscriber to The Athletic, visit theathletic.com forward slash FPL pod where you'll get 33% off an annual subscription. And in doing so, you'll get ad-free versions of this podcast. The headlines from Game Week 9. Liverpool hammered Manchester United 5-0 at Old Trafford. Salah getting a hat-trick and an assist. Trent and Diogo Jota were in the points as well. Chelsea wing-backs Ben Chilwell and Rhys James were both on the score sheet in the win over Norwich while Mason Mount matched Salah with three goals and an assist for 24 points. Phil Foden racked up 18 points in Manchester City's 4-1 win at Brighton. Claudio Ranieri's Watford stunned Everton with a 5-2 victory at Goodison Park. 5.5 million forward Josh King was the third player to score a hat-trick in Game Week 9. That doesn't happen very often, a hat-trick of hat-tricks. Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang got his fourth goal in six games as Arsenal beat Aston Villa 3-1. The Ramsdale clean sheet wipeout was a frustrating start to the game week for many. Smithrow owners got 13 points from him with a goal, an assist and three bonus. Rafinha hobbled off for Leeds following a terrible tackle by Roman Saiz. Hopefully he's not out for too long. Budget gem Tino Liveramento scored his first goal of the season for Southampton and it won't be his last. He hit the post in that game as well. And 5 million forward Armando Broya made it two goals in two starts but he's also got a yellow flag. Jamie Vardy went off injured at half time during Leicester's 2-1 win at Brentford. And finally Mikel Antonio was the match winner for West Ham against Tottenham scoring his sixth goal of the campaign. Game Week 9 shoutouts, welcome to the 59th Minute Club, Anthony Gordon of Everton. The Everton fans weren't happy when he was substituted, but I certainly was. So welcome to the club. Notable mentions from Game Week 9, players who went off earlier than expected. Jamie Vardy and Mason Greenwood, both off at half time. Rafinha, 53 minutes. Mbumo, 56 minutes. Neil Mopai at Brighton, 57 minutes against Manchester City. And back to Manchester United, Bruno Fernandes and Rashford managed just 61 minutes. And at Watford, Saar, 63. Very frustrating for Saar owners because I think they might have scored four goals after Saar went off. So probably nothing to worry about, really. I think Saar is Watford's best player and he should get 90 minutes most weeks. But obviously a little bit worrying if you are a Saar owner and 
more frustration than worry given they scored five goals and he wasn't involved. A quick review of how game week nine went for me. It was a big game week and it felt like it came at the right time. Last couple of game weeks hadn't been great, but playing the wild card in game week eight has given me two back to back green arrows. This week, I went Lukaku to Vardy with the free transfer, which obviously wasn't great, but the Lukaku injury was a blessing in disguise because I was going to captain Lukaku which resulted in me changing it to Salah, which resulted in a good game week. So I finished on 111 points. It's not very often I score over 100, so really enjoyed the game week. My rank went from 178k to 45k, so nice to be inside the top 50k at this stage of the season. The good and the bad. The good, first of all, Salah 48, Trent 10, Mason Mount 24. So I was glad I picked up Mason Mount on the wildcard in game week 8. Because if I didn't, I probably would have joined other people on getting Havertz this week instead of Mason Mount. So that was, you know, I, I've said a few times this week, the stars kind of aligned for me in many ways this week. So I feel quite fortunate to have such a big game week. Ben Chilwell with 12, another great pickup on the wild card, and kept the faith with Antonio, who got me seven points. The bad, Ramsdale, no clean sheet. Going to give him another few weeks before I start worrying about that one though. Ruben Diaz and Cancelo. Thank you Ederson for giving away that penalty. That was also frustrating. Rafinha off injured and nothing from Ivan Tony. But watching the highlights from the Brentford game, I liked what I've seen of Ivan Tony. And I still think he's a very good pick for the next couple of game weeks. Nothing from Vardy and had Liveramento on the bench like many people. So it's it's got to the point now where we, we need to try and start Liveramento rather than having on on the bench. I think he was my second sub last week. He certainly won't be this week. I'll be moving him at least to first sub, if not into the starting 11. A watch list update now. First of all, players removed from the watch list following game week nine. Kevin De Bruyne, just way too expensive for a player who can be benched in any given game week. I much prefer Phil Foden from the Manchester City midfield. So De Bruyne is not no longer in my thoughts. I've removed the West Ham guys as well, Jared Bowen and Said Ben Rama. I'm quite happy with Antonio, but I don't really fancy the West Ham double up in attack. So Ben Rama and Bowen are gone from the watches as well, as is Andros Townsend from Everton. Just Everton are not a team I really want to invest in at the moment. If I was forced to, it probably would be Damari Gray. He seems to be quite consistent in his performances week after week. I think he got another assist at the weekend, but no longer interested in Townsend. But Damari Gray remains on the watch list, but very unlikely to come into my squad. Quite a few players added to the watch list this week. Reese James, given that I sold Lukaku, I've now got a third spot free for a Chelsea player. I've got Chilwell and I've got Mount, but I'm very tempted by Reese James as well, given his performance at the weekend. Rudiger is back on my watch list as well. Had him a couple of weeks ago. I think I got rid of him on the wild card. If I want to go a safer route, if I'm going to double up on the Chelsea defence again, then Rudiger is an option as well. Got an assist for winning the penalty. Robertson at Liverpool has been added to the watch list for the first time in a while as well. I've got Salah, I've got Trent, so I do have that third spot free for a third Liverpool player as well. Can't see myself going for Jota, can't see myself going for Manny. So that has been looking towards the defence as a potential double up option. I like Van Dijk as well, but I think there's only 0.4 million between himself and Robertson. And Robertson gives you, you know, much more attack and threat. So Robertson is in my thoughts for the first time in quite a while. Another defender I've added is Rico Henry from Brentford. I don't think he has any attacking returns yet. Maybe one assist, if anything. I think he looked much better at the weekend going forward. He's only about 4.5 million, so I think he will get attacking returns this season. So if you're looking for a very cheap defender, I like Rico Henry because Brentford have good fixtures. Midfielders added this week. I mentioned Phil Foden, who's already on the watch list, but I've also added Gundogan. Good to see him on the score sheet again. Every time I watch Manchester City, to me, Gundogan passes the eye test because he gets into really good positions. And we've seen that with his goal. You know, he put it into the back of the net from about two yards out, so he gets right into the six-yard box. So I like Gundogan. I think Foden is the Manchester City midfielder to go for. But if you fancy something different or you can't afford Foden, I still think Gundogan is a good pick as well. Smith Rowe who I did consider for my wildcard two weeks ago, but he didn't make the cut. Good performance in game week nine, so I like him as an option now as well. I like him more than Saka. Saka seems to be a little bit injury-prone these days. Uh, Smith-Rowe's cheaper, so if I'm going to go for an Arsenal midfielder 
in the near future. It's going to be Smith Rowe. Also added from Burnley, Corney. What a player this guy is. Two goals for Burnley in their draw with Southampton. Every time I've seen him this season, again, passes the eye test with flying colours. He he almost looks out of place in the Burnley team. You know, we come to expect Burnley as that kind of old-fashioned defence first kind of team but they haven't been very good defensively this season and they do look okay going forward at times and I think this guy Cornet if he if he stays fit I think he's about 6 million I think he's a nice differential option when Burnley have good fixtures moving on to strikers added to the watch list Aubameyang you know he's started to score goals again he's 10 million so he's an awkward price but Lukaku's injured Vardy could be injured Ronaldo's not cutting it Kane's not doing much so Almost by process of elimination, Aubameyang comes into our thinking now as well. And I think there's, I think he, he can be purchased. I think he could do well. He, I think he could continue to score goals because Arsenal have turned the corner. So Aubameyang on the watch list probably for the first time this season. Ben Teke, didn't think I'd be adding him to the watch list this season, but very impressive performance in game week nine. Edward is already on the watch list, but I think Ben Teke is probably the better option at the moment because he's playing more centrally than Edward. The caveat here is Zaha was on the bench at the weekend, so we don't know what happens when Zaha comes back in. Does that mean one of Benteke or Edward might have to drop out? Because Olise looks a pretty good player playing from the right. So there's a lot of competition in the Crystal Palace attack, which gives me slight pause about buying the likes of Edward or Benteke. But I'm certainly going to monitor the situation closely. And if Benteke continues to play the way he has been, over the last two or three game weeks, maybe we could get back to the Ben Teke of old when he was at Aston Villa. Maybe having Patrick Vieira as his manager is going to get the best out of him. He certainly looks like he's playing with a bit of confidence now, apart from that shot that he had 1v1 that he put wide. So he still is Ben Teke, but if he's going to get plenty of chances, he will get points at a good price. If Jamie Vardy gets ruled out for a while, I think Ian Acho could become an option. He started, I think, the last three games in the league. And even if Vardy is fit, hopefully Iheanacho continues to start alongside him. So I've seen a few people starting to talk about Iheanacho and he's added to my watches. I don't think we can go for him just yet unless Vardy is ruled out. Then maybe he is a differential to go for because there's not that many strikers at the moment who, who are interested in me. So Iheanacho comes into my thinking this week. And finally, Josh King, after his hat-trick, you know, he's an amazing price. He's only 5.5 million. A lot of managers are in the market for a cheap striker, especially if they're moving more cash into midfield or defence. So I think Josh King is as good as anyone around, you know, less than 6 million. Moving on now to the questions from Twitter. Thanks as always to everyone who sent them in. First one to tackle this week is from Anthony. What are your thoughts on squad structure when we can pair my captain Salah and look to spread funds across our squads? So yeah, I think the way this season is shaping up, certainly at the moment, to me now, Salah just gets the armband every week for the foreseeable future. So basically we're playing with 10 players if most people are going to do that. And when Ronaldo is not firing, when Lukaku is injured and not really firing anyway when he was fit, Kane is not really convincing us that he's worth investment either. That kind of cuts out a lot of the expense of players. So I do like the idea now of just captain and Salah every week. And with your next couple of transfers, or if you're wildcarding soon, you know, spreading the cash around the squad. And it's not just within your starting 11, spreading the cash on the bench as well. Because a lot of the high performing players recently are the likes of Chilwell. Reese James, you know, these wing backs that can still be benched in any given game week. So I think benches are more important in FPL than ever before. I think that's just the way the game's going over the last, you know, two or three seasons. The wing backs, if you want the more exciting wing backs with the high upside, you've got to have, you know, better benches than we would have had four or five seasons ago when they weren't really needed. You know, most weeks we're seeing at least our first sub needed, if not you know, two of them, depending if you've got a few risky picks in your squad. You know, players like Havertz and Phil Foden come into that as well. So I think these high upside exciting picks are worth having. And I think it's easier to go for them now because we can have a little bit more cash on our bench. For example, I think Mbumo is my first 
saw me is about 5.5 million. I never would have did that before. Usually my, my benches would just be, you know, two 4.5s and a 4 million. But I've got Mbumo at the moment, and I like having that pretty good option as a first sub. And I've got Livermento. I think Livermento is up to 4.4 million now. But I, th- I just think he's you know one of the best options as a first sub out there there is at the moment. So yes, I do like the idea. Sell a captain, spread the cash around, get these exciting picks who are slight rotation risks, but I think they're worth the risk as we've seen, you know, most recently in game week nine. Question from Stevo: Do we stick or twist with Havertz versus Newcastle? If you bought Havertz for Norwich, you keep him for Newcastle. You do not rage transfer him out. Newcastle, in my eyes, is just as good a fixture for attackers. As the Norwich game was, Newcastle gave away lots and lots of chances. Chelsea could easily rack up, maybe not seven, but three or four goals against Newcastle at the weekend. Although I do expect Newcastle to be a bit more gritty under the caretaker coach. But I still think Chelsea will win comfortably. If you've got Havertz, forget about what happened in game week nine. He could be the star of the game week in game week 10. So, you know, if if Havertz starts against Newcastle, I'll be expecting attacking returns from him. So absolutely stick with him, at least for the Newcastle game. Just don't captain him. Question from FPL Bafana. Is Kovacic a good option as a slightly more expensive fifth midfielder over Brownhill, for example, if one has the cash? So yeah, cash is not a huge issue, I think, for most of us at the moment. Kovacic has been having a very impressive season. You know, he's been very creative in that Chelsea midfield, but I still don't like him for FPL because... I think two Chelsea defenders plus Mason Mount or Havertz is probably the way to go at the moment. And the other reason I don't like it is I think two Chelsea defenders looks great at the moment. Ideally, probably Chilwell and Rhys James for the exciting potential. And then when Lukaku comes back in, you want to leave the door open for Lukaku. So, for example, if you go Kovacic and you've got Chilwell and you've got Rudiger, for example, you know, you're blocking yourself to Lukaku. And Lukaku you know, will come into our thinking at some point in the near future. We're going to want him back. As soon as he's back in the team and he's back in the goals, we're all going to start looking to Lukaku again. So you don't really want to block that through Kovacic. So Kovacic, although he's been great, and I think he's he's a fine pick maybe as a bench option, but I wouldn't go there just because it could create problems down the line. Question from Sebastian. What do we do with Christensen? He looked like a good way into the Chelsea eleven, but now he feels like a rotation risk. If I own Christensen, I would be selling now. I think I said last week you keep him until you see him get benched again. He did get benched again. And the thing with Chelsea centre-backs, he plays three of them, but he's got six or seven options. You know, Saar had a good game recently. He likes Chalaba. There's just too many options, and Christensen's probably not going to get as much game time now as he got, you know, first four or five game weeks of the season. So I think Christensen is not worth holding anymore and I'd be looking to sell him, but obviously focus on other fires in your team first. Question from Vivek. Is it still worth getting on the Mount train even though I own Foden? Absolutely. I mean, Mason Mount is not going to score a hat-trick every, every week. There's probably a good chance that he'll never score a hat-trick again, but that doesn't mean he's not a good pickup. If you missed his points last week, Mount has always been a player, in my eyes, who kind of ticks along nicely. He'll probably get you six points per game week over a long stretch of time, which is fine for his price. So I think Mount is a good option that you can stick in there and just keep him long term. And he should tick over nicely, in particular when Chelsea have good fixtures. So I still think Mason Mount is a very good transfer in this week. and I think a lot of people will go there, in particular, if Rafinha gets ruled out. When it comes to Mount versus Foden... I think ideally you probably have both of them. If you can only get to one, even though mine got me 24 points last game week, I think Foden's the better option long term. Foden plays for the team who scores more goals. I think he's got the higher upside. You know, he's basically playing out of position as a striker in most games. So I think Foden over Mason Mount. But if you can get both of them, I think that's a good approach to take. Question from FPL Claret. Who's the best Jamie Vardy replacement if he gets ruled out of the weekend? My notes beside this question say I'm not seeing any strikers that I love, which is why I might move to Son or Foden instead. So, for example, if Rafinha gets ruled out and Vardy gets ruled out, which could easily happen, I think I'll end up taking a minus four possibly to move the Vardy cash into Rafinha's position with someone like Foden or Hyungman Son and then just go for a cheaper striker. 
there's quite a lot of strikers on my watch list at the moment, but I'm not, you know, in a mad rush to get any of them. You know, players like Aubameyang, Jimenez, Callum Wilson, Ian Acho, if Hardy's out, and Harry Kane are all on my watch list. But again, none of them are crying out, you know, by me at the moment. If I ended up going for someone like Son or Foden in midfield, I'm probably looking at the cheaper guys, you know, the likes of Jimenez, Wilson or Ian Acho. And I, I think probably Jimenez is the one I like most, just 90 minute man on penalties. I think Wolves have been pretty decent this season. You know, I love Callum Wilson as a player, but, you know, how much faith do I have in Newcastle is the question. And Ian Acho, always a bit of a rotation risk. Even if Vardy's out, you know, there's Daka there now as well. Harvey Barnes hasn't played the last two game weeks. You know, will he come back in? So, yeah, Jimenez is probably the one I'll go for if I end up going cheaper with a striker to get someone like Foden or Hillman Son. So, yeah, not too many strikers I like at the moment. If you don't have Antonio, I still think he's right up there as one of the best options. Next question is from Partho. Who do you think is the best budget striker to get now, Tony or Huang? So... I still think Tony's the best option. He's got penalties. Huang doesn't. Brentford are top of the fixture ticker for the next four game weeks. And like I said, I've seen enough of Tony at the weekend to suggest to me that he will get goals over the next four game weeks. So I think Tony's still by far and away the best cheap striker, even though he hasn't been amazing so far. The other options on the watch list who are classed as budget strikers, Josh King, I think is a fine pickup. Benteke, do have my doubts there. Edward also, same reasons as Benteke. I probably would avoid both. And then Breuer at Southampton. You know, Breuer at Southampton looks like an amazing budget option, but he's got that yellow flag, which is very annoying. And even if he didn't have the yellow flag, you know, he's still competing with the likes of Armstrong and Che Adams. So there's doubts there. I think I like Josh King most out of King, Benteke, Edward and Breuer. But for me, it's got to be Tony. And then Huang is probably second on the list, given he's, he's playing a lot of minutes and Wolves have quite decent fixtures coming up as well so yeah Ivan Tony, he's in my team and he's the one I'd be buying this week if I didn't already own him question from Josh is it time to move away from three playing strikers to invest more in our midfields yeah given what I've said already in the podcast I think you can guess my answer is probably yes you know I've got Antonio who I'm happy with I've got Tony who I'm happy with and I'm not keen on too many of the other strikers. So I do like the idea of moving to five in midfield or even four at the back or even five at the back. You know, there's lots of high performing defenders at the moment. So you can move your cash back towards midfield or defence. That's probably what I'm going to do this week if the injuries are confirmed. Question from Simon. Are the attack and fullbacks now essential over the safe centre backs? even if they're more risk of rotation. So yeah, again, just on what I said earlier, I think the fullbacks are worth the risk now. You know, I mentioned players like Robertson, Chilwell, Rhys James, Cancelo. You know, FPL is supposed to be fun. Wingbacks are a lot more fun than centre-backs. You know, for example, you know, the likes of Diaz, Van Dijk, Rudiger. They're good picks in their own right. But yeah, I want to have as much fun as possible. And, and maybe in previous seasons, I wouldn't have been as inclined to go for players like Chilwell on a wild card but I think because we've got the strong benches now it makes it a lot easier to do so so yeah totally agree on that one as well and final question and this is one I'll probably ask myself later this week is it worth starting Ben Foster over Ramsdale or Sanchez this week Leicester have been held scoreless just once this season you know Leicester play Arsenal and Brighton play Liverpool so those of us who have Ben Foster on the bench have a question to ask ourselves but the way I look at Foster is I just got him because he's 4 million never really intended to play him don't expect many clean sheets from Watford at all this season so I'm viewing Ramsdale as my set and forget goalkeeper so I'm going to start Ramsdale and I'm probably not going to give Ben Foster any thought because I can just see it already you start Foster you bench Ramsdale or Sanchez and your set and forget goalkeeper gets you 10 points on the bench and Foster gets you two points. So yeah, Ramsdale for me in goal this weekend over Ben Foster. I think it's a little bit trickier if you have Sanchez because it's a tougher fixture. Sanchez plays Liverpool. You're not expecting much, but then look at Sanchez. He got four points against Manchester City, so he can do it in the trickier fixtures. Yeah, I probably would just stick with those guys, Ramsdale and Sanchez, view them as season keepers, and, and keep them in goal for game week 10. Game week 10 captaincy, Mohamed Salah, end of conversation. The way he's playing and the way Liverpool are playing, 
we've just got to captain him for his foreseeable future until we see things change in terms of his form or Liverpool's form or maybe the form of another asset who is not performing at the moment for example Ronaldo or Lukaku or Harry Kane so looking at Liverpool's fixtures they don't face Manchester City or Chelsea right up until game 21 so I think we will see managers captain Salah from now right up until game week 20 so for the next what's that 11 game weeks and around that time of game week 21 is when the African Cup of Nations will begin and Salah will probably head off for three or four weeks so yeah Salah auto captain is what I plan to do for the next couple of game weeks at least Liverpool of Brighton this weekend who just conceded four to Manchester City so I think Salah captain is the standout option again this weekend in terms of transfers for game week 10 this early in the week I don't have an answer basically because there's a lot of unknowns this week we've got the EFL Cup games for a start which could you know throw up a few more issues my transfers this week depend on the status of Vardy Rafinha and Mbumo I've got all three of those all three of them are flagged so I need to see what happens in the press conferences for those ones top of my wanted list are Phil Foden and Hyungman Son. So there's a very good chance I'll go for one of those guys this week. And I'm also open to a minus four if Rafinha and Vardy are ruled out. If the flags disappear somehow, quite tempted by Ruben Diaz to reach James. But I think rather than do that, I'd probably bank the transfer instead if I don't have any issues come Friday night slash Saturday morning. So in Friday's podcast, I will update my transfer plans. Hopefully I'll have a clearer idea by then of what I'm doing. Thank you for tuning in to this episode. Please leave a review wherever you're listening and make sure to hit subscribe for Friday's episode. If you'd like to support me as a full-time fantasy manager, check out patreon.com forward slash FPL general where you'll get extra content and podcast throughout the season. Have a great week, folks. Enjoy the EFL Cup ties if you're watching them and I'll talk to you again on Friday. The Athletic.